Good afternoon and welcome to the 159th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today we have a researchers roundtable with Angie Mejia, Chandi Katoch, and Jorge Benavides Rawson. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word, send suggestions for future guests, future topics, please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 29th, 2020, there are 1,176,726 deaths from COVID-19 globally. According to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, there are 8,873,861 cases of COVID-19 in the United States. It's up from 8,812 thousand three hundred eighteen yesterday there are now a total of two hundred twenty seven thousand nine hundred sixty eight deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19 up from two hundred twenty seven thousand one hundred nine reported yesterday as a way to bring some humanity to the numbers I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic and I'd like to continue that now headline a black family battled COVID-19 at the same time as Trump. It devastated them by Michael Miller. This was published October 28th in the Washington Post. Marine One landed on the White House lawn just before dusk. As its rotors came to a halt, the helicopter's door swung open and out stepped Donald Trump. The president had just spent three days in Walter Reed National Military Medical Center recovering from COVID-19 the disease caused by the novel coronavirus. And in a scene that would be set to dramatic music and tweeted to his 87 million followers, he climbed the steps to a White House balcony, took off his face mask and recorded a video urging the country not to fear the deadly disease. Don't let it dominate you, he said into a camera on the evening of October 5th. We have the best medical equipment, we have the best medicines, all developed recently and you're gonna beat it. 30 miles away, Carlton Coates Jr. sat in an Annapolis funeral home, staring at the casket that contained the body of his older sister. Carol Coates had battled COVID-19 at the same time as the president, but instead of a suite at Walter Reed, the 46-year-old black teacher self-isolated in the basement of her family's home, and instead of the experimental cocktail of antibodies that Trump was given, she received get well cards from her fifth grade students. Carol had taught nine miles from the White House, but her illness unfolded in what seemed like a different universe than the one the president described. Don't let it take over your lives, Trump said during his triumphal homecoming video. Yet for many people of color in the United States, the coronavirus has already taken the life of someone they loved. It would take even more from Carlton Coates. His phone buzzed during his sister's funeral, but the 43-year-old truck driver ignored it. It was only when he returned home and saw people gathered in the driveway that he knew something else had gone wrong. As they stepped out of the car, his fiance pulled him aside. I hate to tell you this, she said, but your mom passed away. Carol Coates and her mother, Dale, could hardly have been closer. They lived in the same house outside of Annapolis, along with Carlton and his fiance. They loved the same music and colorful clothes. Carol draped her mother in jewelry, Dale talked about her daughter so much that colleagues who'd never met Carol felt like they knew her. They were inseparable, Carlton said. The family had been vigilant ever since Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, a Republican, had shut down much of the state on March 12th, the same day Trump insisted the pandemic was going to go away, a claim he has made dozens of times. By then, a member of Carol and Carlton's congregation was already sick with COVID-19 and would soon be put on a ventilator. Within a few weeks, a couple connected to Dale's church would die of the disease. As the saying goes, when white folks catch a cold, black folks catch pneumonia, said the Reverend Stephen Tillett, 
Dale's pastor at Asbury Broadneck United Methodist Church. The Coates family feared the virus, especially because Dale's 74-year-old fiance and her 84-year-old mother also lived with them. But with four members of the household going to work throughout the pandemic, they wouldn't be able to escape it. They depended on their parents for everything. Then the virus took both. Dale was one of the two black receptionists at a predominantly white retirement home called Sunrise Senior Living in Annapolis, where the 66-year-old was known for having a personality as bright as her outfits. She was a very jolly person, always smiling, recalled Carolyn Muir, who left Sunrise in 2018 to return to her native England, but not before Dale introduced her to the wonders of go-go and gospel. As the pandemic deepened, hitting one nursing home after another, and eventually infecting four residents and nine employees at Sunrise, Dale kept working, despite her worries over falling ill. Sunrise Senior Living said in a statement that it has been vigilant in preventing the spread of the coronavirus, giving employees masks and other personal protective equipment. Carol hadn't gone into Adelphi Elementary School in Prince George's County since mid-March, but she still spent hours each day in front of her computer, making sure her fifth graders, many of whom were English language learners or in special education, had access to the internet and course materials. On September 24th, her students emailed her get well cards. Dear Miss Coates, I hope you feel better, one girl wrote next to a cartoon drawing of a teacher in front of a chalkboard. We miss you and hope to see you next Monday. Friends and family members left food at the top of the basement stairs, including bottles of her favorite orange juice, Florida's Natural. Two floors up, Dale was also struggling. She had long suffered from arthritis and carpal tunnel syndrome, her son said, but now she was so exhausted she could hardly get out of bed. She, too, had tested positive and stayed home from work. Her fiancé, Ernest Davis, brought her food and slept on the floor next to her bed. On Sunday, September 27th, Dale was so weak that Davis called 911. Her family watched from a distance as she was loaded into an ambulance and taken to Ann Arundel Medical Center. Stuck in the basement, Carol couldn't even say goodbye. Carlton was at work that afternoon when he received a worried call from Wilson, who hadn't been able to reach Carol. Carlton dialed his 15-year-old daughter and asked her to check on her auntie. But when the teenager shouted down into the basement, there was only silence. Carlton told her to put on a mask and gloves and then watched on FaceTime as his daughter descended into the basement and looked into Carol's bedroom. I just saw my daughter's face, he recalled. She just peeked in there and then ran back upstairs, kind of traumatized. For the second time in as many days, an ambulance pulled up to the house with blue shutters, but this time there would be no trip to the hospital. For three days, Carlton struggled to sleep and eat while making funeral arrangements for Carol. When he and Juanette went back to visit Dale on the evening of October 1st, they found her oxygen tube had been replaced by an oxygen mask. A doctor warned them that her oxygen levels were still dangerously low. When Dale spoke, however, she seemed upbeat. She was praising and worshiping God, lifting up her hands, Carlton recalled. At one point, he and his mother sang Carol's favorite gospel songs through their masks. But when he called to check on her the next day, a nurse told him that Dale was being put on a ventilator. I love you, he told her over the phone. Be strong. Hang in there. I need you. By the time the president was released three days later, feeling, he said, better than 20 years ago, Dale and her daughter were both dead. Okay, let's turn to our conversation for today. Really looking forward to this researcher's roundtable. Let me introduce my guest to you. Jorge Benavides Rawson is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the George Washington University and a visiting fellow in the Harvard Kennedy School's program on science, technology, and society. Mm -hmm. His dissertation research examines the interaction of public health policymakers, scientists, and the media as co-producers of international and global policies for epidemics and pandemics. To trace the co-production of pandemics, Jorge is conducting multi-sided ethnographic fieldwork, comparing diverse forms of knowledge production about Zika virus and COVID-19 in various locations of the United States and his home country of Costa Rica. Jorge holds a master's degree in medical anthropology from the George Washington University. 
Chandy Katoch is a senior at the University of Minnesota Rochester studying health sciences. She's pursuing medical school with the intent to work as a physician in emergency medicine. She currently works in a group home healthcare setting and is an emergency medical technician. She's a board member of the Village Community Garden and Learning Center in Rochester, Minnesota, where she researches resiliency in diverse growers. She's also researching mental health in black indigenous people of color, uh, focusing on women pursuing STEM careers. Angie Mejia is assistant professor and civic engagement scholar at the Center for Learning Innovation at the University of Minnesota, Rochester. Her research uses participatory methods and cross-community collaborations to study emotional health inequities in historically marginalized and socio-politically dispossessed communities. Her work has appeared in several academic journals, including Theory in Action, Action Research, Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems and Community Development, and Cultural Studies Critical Methodologies. And you can check out her website, angiemejia.com, A-N-G-I-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-E-M-
police departments can help each other so they can they can request aid and and also you know first responders so there is there is a lot of coordination and so for the most part the the Nor northern virginia area and dc and and south maryland have had more or less similar you know policies even including for example when they chose the date to end the you know the, the strict quarantine and things like that or the open level schools it's been it's been sort of parallel the rest of maryland the rest of virginia it's another story i appreciate your focus on the collaboration and coordination doesn't make quite as many headlines and i know that listeners who are emergency managers are interested in emergency management always feel that coordination doesn't get the kind of attention <laughs> when, when they get it right no, nobody pays attention to that but you've just described the complexity of that disaster in that yeah place where this uh, different polities come together. Chandy, can I turn to you next for the same question? Where are you calling from and, and what's the pandemic look like there today? Yeah, thank you. Um, so both Dr. Mejia and I are calling from Southeastern Minnesota, Rochester to be exact, the home of Mayo Clinic. Um, we're calling from our respective homes though. So we are staying safe. Um, and as of today, there are all uh, 3,400 cases of COVID in Olmsted County, which is where Rochester is. And Minnesota has just over um, 139,000 positive cases. So we are seeing an upward trend right now, about 2,000 new cases per day. Um, and I think that's largely impacted by our surrounding states. So we have North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin surrounding us. And they're all seeing some of the worst um, epidemics and pandemics that they've seen, outbreaks that they've seen in the past few weeks. Um, so we're starting to be affected by that. Additionally, um, Donald Trump is coming to Rochester tomorrow. Um, he's going to be having an event just outside of Rochester, about 16 miles from the University of Minnesota, Rochester. Um, and according to some local city council members, it's expected that there will be 25,000 people in attendance at that rally. So that might be a super spreader event and that could definitely impact our number of positive cases. Well, I presume the president has access to polls that I can't see, but I don't know what he thinks he's doing coming to Minnesota at this stage. Um, that situation you're describing sounds like a really pretty desperate one. Let me ask you a follow up of that because um, that geography you're describing is, a, is an interesting one. I, is the surge of cases in the surrounding states being felt in the health system in Minnesota as well? Either Chandy wow. or Angie, if you know, yeah. Well, you know, I was gonna pass it to Shandy because she actually works, um, and a lot of our students actually work as healthcare technicians uh, within the area, but um, I've been pretty re tired from just even going outside, but I can tell you that um, I know when I see the news, you know, you can hear, you can see Mayo saying, we're going to close for this moment to visitors. We're going to, you know, so it's very interesting how the information of how it's looking, even though we are just so close to Mayo, at least in my vantage view, has been that you know, that people are wearing their masks in some areas in Rochester. However, when I drive out, nobody's wearing their masks <laughs> at all. And there's, you know, events, like there's car shows, there's all of these things going on. So it's it's a very queer experience of, you know, seeing different things at the same time, Speci specifically when we, uh, you know, our, our area Rochester is actually called Med City um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of, you know, professional healthcare workers that live in the city that, you know, that, that run the city. So but Chandy, yeah. No, go ahead. Um, I have heard reports in the last week that our hospitalizations in Minnesota have actually doubled in the past month. Mm -hmm. um, so I would assume that's because of our, our surrounding states as well. Um, and just commenting on that rural versus urban um, sort of feeling about the virus that Jorge kind of touched on. Um, I think that our urban areas like Rochester, St. Paul, Minneapolis are doing really well in abiding by mask mandates and other statewide policies. But once you go into the rural areas where, you know, there's not as much um, buy-in, I guess, into COVID-19 and the, the, the effects that PE and, you know, those policies have in, in preventing the disease spread, I think there's a lot less um, adherence mm -hmm. to those guidelines mm -hmm. and that definitely yeah. is, is increasing our cases. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thanks for that. Let me just follow up with Angie. Um, yeah. We know where you're calling from. Chandy told us about that. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us a little bit of a, a little bit more of what you're seeing there, and particularly on campus? So, um, what I, one thing that I'm glad before I, I before I became an assistant professor at UMR, um, I was University of Minnesota Rochester. I was at a campus where students will not be able to adhere to the co uh, to the mask mandates our students are you know are are know the health care health you know health, you know transmission and health discourse they know that they know how to adhere to that so our campus i feel has been very safe like uh, it's not like i'm seeing you know where we have to enforce like we need to go ahead and tell our students to wear their masks you know we know that we we trust them and we know that we're safe because of that i mean we have a very strict mask wearing policy everywhere we where we go where our offices are um again sometimes outside and then you see that you see people wearing their masks even outside it's it's such an interesting i myself as an immunocompromised person i haven't gone outside that much i'm just i'm terrified and just you know just hearing about my students actually not only following those rules of mask wearing but they also work as healthcare workers and my worry is about what the external forces that they cannot control um even as safe as they keep themselves well Let's just start hearing a bit more about the research that you're all been mm -hmm. doing. I can't mm -hmm. wait to find out about it. Yeah. And, um, maybe, um, can I, Angie, let me just stay with you. <laughs> and can you tell me a little bit about um, the unit that you're in? And I mean, you shared with me some of the many projects that you're working on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Fascinating. So tell me a little bit about your position there at the university, and then let's talk about some of the work. Yeah, so our university is um, one of the smaller campus of the larger University of Minnesota system. Um, we are a health science campus, so our students are all undergraduates. They all have one major, health sciences, and and um, and that's it. There's no minors. There's no uh, what I call counter spaces. Like when I was an undergrad myself, I had the counter space of like I don't like biology, so I went to anthropology. Um, and uh, many of them end up either doing internships research working in Mayo or in other areas of healthcare. Um, as a very small interdisciplinary unit, we don't have disciplinary homes, so we're all the center of learning innovation. And at this, in, in, in this campus, you know, very small, I think we are the smallest, we are, have the largest um, percentage of students of color in, um, in all of the other systems. Mm -hmm. We, uh, at the moment, I'm conducting several studies. So one of the studies is, um, Again, and then I'm taking this from Deborah Lupton, who said that all of us are now COVID researchers, right? I wasn't, were, you know, thinking of like, oh, I need to research COVID. But one of them is um, looking at the experiences and perspectives of women of color students, um, undergrad, STEM, pre-med, and how they navigate to social crisis. So first COVID, but also systemic racism and its manifestations in a place like Minnesota. Uh, and that is the study where um, Chandy is my research assistant. Um, and then this very mini base projects are base projects that looks at um, how to deal with isolation, how to use uh, artistic creative methods for our students to um, pass down messages of hope to each other in, in, in these isolating times and also how to you know, we had to build some form of communities because our community, our community as a campus, were very close. You know, the students were very small classes. We co-teach classes. Our students teach classes with us, um, and they conduct research with us. So it's it's COVID has really disrupted the feel of what our campus used to be. Mm. So just following up, Chandi, yeah. you've been working with Angie. Can you tell us a little bit about your role in the project? Yeah, thank you. Um, so within the project on um, researching the emotional and mental health of uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, women in STEM, um, we've been just starting now to conduct um, community conversations with small groups, small focus groups uh, of these students to kind of get a feeling of what what, I, what ideas they have of, you know, what is stressing you out? Is it 
Is it, you know, things like social justice and George Floyd? Is it COVID? Is it, um, you know, quarantine fatigue? What is stressing you out right now? Um, and then from there, we're going to be moving on into more individualized interviews where we can ask more specific questions to get a, a better notion of the mental and emotional health of these women, um, specifically acknowledging that they are women of color in a STEM career, which is traditionally a white male dominated field and how that is also affecting their emotional and mental health. There's so many points of intersection here. We think about what causes stress and what a disaster is. Could it just say, can you, I'd like to hear Angie and then also Chandi, just how you even begin to engage that conversation? Like you ask Ooh. people, how are you feeling about what it means to go into health sciences in the midst of a pandemic? I mean, I often find it where these disasters have all aggregated in such ways that it's hard to even know where to begin the conversation, I feel like. Angie, can I ask you that first and then Chandi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting enough, like I said, we all have become COVID uh, researchers, right? And for me, the, the summer where I was supposed to be, you know, doing what a first year professor is supposed to be doing, working on their book, became a way of, uh, I had to provide support to my students of color because uh, after um, George Floyd, more of the asks for support was like trying to navigate a place that was dealing with the national spotlight on a problem that has been going on here in a very unique way on, you know, not only systemic racism and its manifestations, but a specific Minnesota culture of niceness and white fragility. So a lot of my students are coming in asking all of these things. So now that we are saying, okay, why don't we have community conversations? A lot of them have been wanting to talk about this. Like we just ask what is going on? How did your routine, I actually started a focus group. How did your routine change in February? Tell me a typical day in February, how did it change? And most of the time, it goes from there. It goes from there about, you know, having to deal with the additional stressors, seeing those additional stressors once the spotlight on race, racism, and racial tensions in Minnesota happens. Um, I don't even need to have a research schedule because a lot of these conversations go along those ways of needing the space to talk, needing the space to be critical about what's going on, and needing the space to understand how to to navigate it. Um, I was, uh, you know, one of the, you know, very, what I would say, very preliminary findings that I'm seeing is that, you know, you have these students um, uh, that are struggling to make sense of a very disordered world. But if you imagine, and Jorge, you, you, you have an MD, so you understand what it is to be a medical student. So these are super dedicated, extremely studious students who have not only do extra credit work, do extra classes, do extra volunteering, do extra of everything. They sacrificed a lot of their normal college experience um, to go. So they, they follow the rules of the lab, of the scientific methods, of math, of everything. And then they go into a world where scientific knowledge, scientific denialism is now driving our political realities. So, you know, they, they experience this very weird sense of anomie. And I'm going to, you know, forgiveness to the scientific, non-social scientists out there. So anomie is this sense of normlessness where society's rules and, you know, our, 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 our processes have been thrown in a state of chaos and people can't make sense. So there's this sense of uncertainty uncertainty just, you know, puts people in a powerless position and, and creates all of these stressors. So my students are, are trying to deal with a sense of anomie. And I'm, you know, I, 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 like I said, I wasn't trained to help them navigate this. I'm being myself, right? To how can I help you navigate this? But, you know, you, we've trained you to be scientists and now we're, we're throwing you in a, in a world that is really taking your, whole discipline and actually just dragging it through the dirt. Chandi, I want to ask you that from your your perspective. Uh, you're one of these students that Angie's describing, you know, trying to do everything exactly right. The scores matter, the extracurriculars matter. And yet right now we're seeing, Yeah. I, I'm not to lecture anybody who follows COVID calls about this, but it, it is absolutely fascinating to me to see science both 
held up, and I think Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci and doctors around the world have been looked to intently for knowledge and leadership at this time. And at the same time, you have the president of the United States standing next to them on the dais and saying, don't listen to anything these people say because they're lying to you. Sometimes directly saying that. It's, it's very hard to navigate, especially for somebody who's considering going into medicine. Right. And I think, you know, science, like, like you guys have mentioned, has become so politicized in a way that really nobody, I think, has prepared for, except probably climatologists have been screaming at us this entire time, like, wait, wait, you're going down this path. Um, and so, like, as a student who is, who is learning how to do science during this time, um, I think we also need to start including into our curriculums how to, how to deal with those science deniers. Um, all while understanding that so many uh, U.S. adults are scientifically illiterate. Um, and so navigating, you know, that when I go out into the world, not only will I know how to, will I need to know how to perform science and how to, you know, do research and, and um, interact with patients, but I'll also have to know how to prove that the science that I'm doing is legitimate and factual um, and, and to be able to relate that to people who might have a limited understanding of those complex processes. Um, and that's a really unique challenge that I think professors and, and educators are starting to kind of navigate towards um, addressing. But I think the more that we can do, the faster we can do it, the better, because I think this this uh, train is just going to keep going. Well, there, there's so many dimensions of that I want to ask you about. And as we keep talking, one of the things I want to I want to know what you think about is preparing yourself to treat patients who may not fully acknowledge the science that you will be bringing to heal them. I, I'm going to leave that there for a second. I And just this conversation in the last um, few weeks, I've been thinking a lot about September 11, finishing up a project. And, and I went back and looked and September 11 denial has been pretty consistent. It takes a number of different forms. Um, conspiracy theory, most of the conspiracy theories were focused on um, the idea that the government was hiding something, not much less on the idea that the Twin Towers didn't collapse, although that was part of that. But it's been there. Polls conducted in the years after, first 10 years, and recent polls. And guess what? It's it's increasing. A share of the population that believes that September 11, what happened on that day was a conspiracy, has been increasing. And I say that because as a disaster researcher myself and enmeshed in this community, I would say that in general, we haven't paid enough attention, if any attention, to that issue. We've always treated that as some sort of side thing for somebody else to worry about. Let the social psychologists deal with denial or conspiracy. That's not the core of what we're trying to understand. And Chandi, I think the way you're describing it, I don't know how we can do this kind of work anymore without paying serious attention also to disbelief and denial and conspiracy and disinformation. So more to say about that, but thank you for you know stimulating some some thinking here. Jorge, I want to bring you in now, and I should have acknowledged at the top that you are one of the, the most consistent providers of uh, great feedback on COVID calls, and I want to thank you for that, and I want to ask you to tell us a bit about your, your research. You've been looking at Zika virus and COVID, a multi-site ethnographic project in the midst of a pandemic. Talk to us about it. Yeah, so yeah, so it's I, I get asked also like, oh, did you like decide to study pandemics now? And no, actually, I've been studying that for a while, and it, it all comes, um, you know, from my interest in in medicine. My interest is in in tropical infectious diseases, and before I came to the states, I used to teach that tropical infectious diseases and uh, and public health. Um, so dengue was one of those diseases that I was very interested in, and then. When I finished my master's and started my uh, the PhD early on, that's when the Zika pandemic or epidemic started. Um, and it's the same mosquito. So there was a lot of overlapping in terms of the population that it was affecting. And so I wanted to look at that and, and comparing those two. Um, it was uh, beside the biological uh, you know, comparisons, there were all the different ones that I was looking at, but uh, it was also I was looking for something more productive in terms of a dissertation. Um, and uh, lucky for me, my my chair, the my committee chair, he's a of course an anthropologist, but he's an SDS scholar. So I, I through that I was very I began to get very interested in, in in looking at these issues, not so much from a medical anthropology perspective, which was my previous 
field, but from a science and technology studies one. So in how knowledge is produced and how policy comes about. Um, so at the time I was exposed, for example, uh, uh, you know, one of my big influences is uh, Dr. Jasanov at Harvard, uh, who the, deals a lot with this relationship between you know, like scientific work and uh, policy making and the different legal systems in different countries and doing comparative work. Um, so I was doing that and Zika struck me a lot that it had a bigger media component compared to dengue. And the images of kids with microcephaly, how it was creating a sort of like imaginary in the public, um, even you know, the of pregnant women who got infected, about 7% uh, would have kids with microcephaly. But if you ask people who read the news, they thought that it was you know, almost certainly that you will have it because that was sort of the, the perspective they were getting. So I, I, the first question that came to me was, I don't think the in this case, media is just the messenger, right? There's more to it. And then that's how I, at that time I got exposed to you know, Neil Postman uh, and uh, entertainers to death and looking at just media as epistemology and that concept you know, sort of like blew my mind. Um, and then more recently an anthropologist, uh, Charles Briggs, uh, who's at Berkeley and Daniel Hallin made this great book that's called Making Health Public. Right? So not making public health, but making health public. And he uh, and they look at how media coverage of you know, health news sort of actually shapes medicine and public health work, et cetera. Um, so I thought about mixing them. So you know what? I, I don't think it's enough to look how scientists and policymakers sort of influence each other. I think it's more of a triangle thing, and I should put media there at the sort of same analytical level with the with scientists and policymakers and look at all those. And while I was doing that, of course, COVID came about. So I had this talk with my advisor, like, this is this is evidently it's what's happening and it's, it's more productive. Um, and it's, so now if I want to really use the study media part, then Zika and, Deng uh, sorry, Zika and COVID comparison makes more sense than, than Dengue. Um, but I still had my connections. And policy-wise, Costa Rica and the United States are very different. Um, so it's, it's a good for comparison. You know, Costa Rica has a universal healthcare system. Um, there are certain laws, uh, exceptions that cannot be used. Costa Rica has no military. So for example, uh, there's no martial law that's in our constitution. So the, they have to go about things in different ways. Um, so it's very productive to compare. Um, and of course, because I'm from there and I'm a physician there, it gives me access. So there's that practicality about it. Um, but it's, 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 that was the idea. It was comparing across places, but also across diseases to sort of like find the commonalities, which is not normal in anthropology. Anthropologists tend to do an ethnographic work in a, one place and stay there. Uh, but you know, luckily my advisors are STS people, so they they know this different and you know, help me push that I wanted to do a multi-sided, more comparative work. So that's mm. that's where I am now. Let me just follow up a little bit on the Zika story, if you wouldn't mind, because uh, I think it's a fascinating comparison. Can you situate us that a little bit more in that history? I mean, I know it uh, disease, it's, it's not um, a new virus discovery, but I think in terms of, at least for people in the United States, awareness of it, it's, it's quite recent, probably around the time of the, of the Olympics in, in Brazil. Can you tell us a little bit more of the backstory there? Yeah, so um, Zika is, is uh, uh, in the same family of viruses as dengue and chikungunya and the yellow fever, so they're called flaviviruses, right? They're same and they're transmitted by the same mosquito, the Aedes mosquito. Um, we knew about Zika since the 50s um, because it was first identified um, in Africa in the 1950s, first in animals and then the first human cases. But between the 50s and, you know, the, the 2010, 12, there's been a total of maybe you know, 50 cases or less. Um, so it was occasional. And of course, there was no data to connect to any production of any other effect, right? If, if of those cases, there was a, a case of a, a child with microcephaly, statistically, you couldn't say that they were connected. You could go, oh, it just happened that they got it, right? And then the outbreak came, and that was that's 2015, and it's around the the, the World Cup, and it started uh, a big outbreak in Brazil. And then once the epidemic kept growing, and there were enough cases of it, then you could start seeing the correlation. Like, okay, this amount of microcephaly, it's not normal. It's it's the, it's 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 growing. It's several times higher. Um, first, it was just you know a correlation, and then they started trying to to prove it. 
Um, and eventually they did find the, the mechanism, but they did the, uh, uh, over here, um, they did the, uh, uh, there was a consensus early on, and then the WHO and, and Pan American Health Organization eventually went with the consensus that they were related, and they used this this uh, international legal figure that's important that like, connects Zika with uh, uh, with uh, um, COVID or with Ebola, which is the the public health emergency of international concern, right? It's sort of like a pre-pandemic state and the idea of that is it, it then it, it allows states to sort of have a framework that justifies uh the use of certain laws or you know or or the moving money from from one area to 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 do research etc um and so that it was deployed for sika um and they, they needed to they use that consensus and the the, the push of media uh sort of like Pushed Paho and WHO to, to give that out. So that was the, that's the you know the Zika context, and it did not become a pandemic. It didn't go worldwide. It was mostly restricted to the Americas. It was it was an international epidemic, and um, you know it dwindled down. There's still sporadic cases, but you know, it's still a lot of research going on, trying to see if it's going to spike up again. Dengue, for example, it's there every every single year. The, another, uh, to me, fascinating dimension of this, and you'll have to educate me a little bit on the Costa Rica story, um, the governance of Brazil and the the sort of wild ideological swings in the governance. And I, and I don't, I can't speak with too much background here about um, Costa Rica at all, about how the politics of Zika may have played out there. But the politics of COVID in Brazil have been clear. They've been spot on um, with other authoritarians who've tried to use the virus and the sort of scientific unknowns of it as an opportunity to score political points. Can you tell us a little bit of sort of the political economy of Zika in Costa Rica? Yeah, and and so first we, we sort we have a, a, a like an aversion to authoritarian rulers, and part of that is why we you know we got rid of the military completely in the forties. Um, and, and, and made the rules, the laws in a way that they sort of prevent that. For example, when there's election, there are polls inside, inside jails. That way uh, people who are in prison can vote. That prevents governments from being able to use jail as, as a way to you know, swing or control the population for voting, et cetera. So first there's that. And second is we have a very close relationship with our healthcare system. Uh, the healthcare system that started in the 40s, before we had the revolution that ended with the abolition of, of, of the military, and then it stayed on and actually got a boost once we abolished the military because we got extra money from that and, and education. Um, so that the presence of the universal healthcare that's almost everywhere, primary care clinics everywhere, there's a, a trust level between the population and the healthcare system that might not match the trust with the government, even though it's a government agency, there's in the Costa Rican Imaginarium, they're like there are two different things. Um, and when the uh, the Sika happened, it was a different president. Uh, but now with with COVID, uh, the president pretty much sort of like gave the Minister of Health, who's a physician. Um, we're actually in the same med school. He was about two years ahead of me. Um, the reins, right? He was like you 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 run the shots, you call the shots. You know, I'm 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 going to back you up. So the, the the government is very much being led by by that res public health uh, response. There is, of course, in the population now a lot of different reactions, right? And and the you know, the loss of jobs and the economy has affected people. And there's a discussion about we have to open or not. Um, the official government stance has not been of denial, right? It has been one of of uh, accepting that the facts and sort of following WHO uh, you know, guidelines and then applying them, um, there is pushback. And within Costa Rica, you see groups that are uh, parallel to here, right, of, of, of denying. Uh, there is a, a growing sort of also like a, a, a religious right wing that, that's growing, and they tend to overlap a lot with, mm. with you know, like, people who say, qual pandemia on TV, which is like, what what pandemic? There's no pandemic kind of, kind of thing, right? Especially because... We were doing so well in the first few months that we had, you know, no peaks. The ICUs were not saturated, so it was until the second wave that it, it kind of went up and it went a little crazy. But it, it, that even that, like being doing too well, did not help 
in right credibility about the pandemic. What a strange catch-22 of this disease that success somehow also plays into the hands of the disinfo, disinformation kind of aspect. I want to ask a question that can bring all three of you together on this, and that's to talk about methods. And um, I'm going to start, Angie, with, with you. I, I'm just glancing through some of the materials you sent me. You're using so many different um, ethnographic methods, including autoethnography, video, uh, community. <laughs> gardening tell us a bit about um the practices and then tell us a little bit about the strategy behind those practices and we'll bring chandi in on this too yeah so um autoethnography that was an interesting use of um what i will say pandemic pedag pedagogical thing right meaning it's we were supposed to be working at a community garden collecting mixed methods research on resilience, mental health, and refugee and communities of color that are growing their own vegetables and their own produce. Um, the pandemic comes and obviously everything comes to a stop and um, my students are here. I'm supposed to teach them how to do some form of research methods. So we are like, eventually, you know, it's just gonna say they have to do more than a lit review. Um, I, I, I get them to engage in autoethnography to not only write about their personal experiences about COVID and the emotional climate of COVID, but how to do it with intentionality, how to do it while reading the social world, and how to do it while they engage in a relational relationship with their reader. Um, at first, I think um, Chandy wasn't one of the one of those students, but some students are like, wow, you want us to write personally and critically and how is um, how is this gonna look when I apply for med school? And uh, eventually I convinced them, right? So um, I have seen how liberating it is for them to use these methods. I teach a class on society and mental health where they, um, you know, they listen to lecture, but then they uh, engage in workshops, writing workshops and using autoethnography or using other types of uh, art-based methods. And the, not even talking, the, a lot of their anxieties about COVID have been sublimated into this wonderful creative works of art, whether it's poetry, painting, performance, but also they are very socially and critically nuanced. Um, so that's one thing that I've been continuing with many students. We have collaborated together on collective autoethnographies about COVID. We have one that is about to be published. Um, we can't say it yet because it's on 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 R and R. Um, and then we are doing another one as experiences of women of color. You know, navigating the emotional and symbolic violences of COVID. So it's it's been a very interesting experience. Um, and you know, like the students have really enjoyed working on this um, and gain a lot from it. I think. Chandi, is that been one of the projects you've been engaged with? Yeah, so I have written, what is it now, two, I think, mm -hmm. autoethnographies, we're working on two at least. Um, and, you know, as a health sciences student who, like we've talked about before, like populist and um, sticking to facts and the world is very black and white when you're learning about science, going into a space where it's like, okay, well now tell me how you feel. <laughs> and tell me what your experience is, is like a deer in the headlights moment where, you know, I'd love to tell you, I'll talk about critical race theory. I'm not scared of sociology and psychology. I'll talk about those things, but I don't want to relate them to my life. And I have, like, I think I, I don't speak only for myself when I say that that is scary to do um, when you've never done it before, especially doing it, you know, in your last couple of years of, of undergrad. Um, but I think when you do, you, you get better at not only analyzing others work and and looking at other people's research from a different perspective but you 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 get better at looking at your own work and your own your own life and your own perspective as well which i think makes you just more well-rounded and i think even though that is a daunting ask of a professor to health sciences students i think it's worth it and i think once you start engaging in that sort of autoethnography writing you realize uh, I want to just go a step further with this and ask you, uh, this has been on my mind about doing this kind of research at this time in collecting writing versus collecting audio, mm -hmm. other types of artworks um, versus doing a video diary 
And I don't know if you've done a comparative approach or if you collect everything and you leave it out. Can you say a little bit more about that too? And I'm asking in part, because I'm curious, but also uh, I know there are a lot of anthropology graduate students out there right now who find themselves in the middle of a situation where the nature of their field work is in flux mm -hmm. and people are really right now getting down into the brass tacks of which of these types of methods specifically can they rely on and for what? Angie, let me start with yeah. you and again bring Chandi in the list. Yeah, so um, one thing about our uh, the way we are doing research is that we do have an umbrella IRB, and that really has helped us. And even without having an umbrella IRB, meaning we have an IRB on everything that we do at the Center for Learning and, and, and Research and Innovation Research, um, our IRB at the University of Minnesota, the systems have been really responsive. So that's one thing. So uh, that has facilitated so much of research going forward. And right now, like I said, I bring back Deborah Lupton, who had inspired me with that whole um, doing a, you know, research on a pandemic, because it is a moment where you have to be kind to yourself as a researcher with your methods, and you have to actually get brave with your methods. And again, brave enough as a first year professor uh, saying, you know what, I'm going to stop my research agenda, and I'm going to go ahead and engage in the type of research that a mostly STEM-based um, community of, 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 of colleagues may be like, what is autoethnography? Um, so I think for a lot of the graduate students out there, I think that your best right best way right now to advance your work is make collaborations with those of us because we are in the same position right now as you. We have had to stop our research and we are have to shepherd our own grad students to towards working and you know try to learn as you go. I mean, I'm, you know, if you need to contact me, I mean, I can give you connections or tips on how to really, you know, find joy and also finish your project. Um, I don't know, I think I went on a tangent there, but I've seen that there's, that's a lot of anxiety when it comes to a lot of grad students are doing research there that, you know, how is this very, you know, um, non, systematic way of doing research, how is that going to affect my job choices? But right now you are, you know, we are in a pandemic, right? You are, and your your, your story and your experience is so important. I mean, if you do autoethnography the correct way, you know, you are engaging in a social research method that has an intentionality to it. Chandi, just to bring you back in mm -hmm. for comment on that and also in, I noticed in your bio you're being engaged with community gardening, right? And that's also one of the practices that's been sort of wrapped up with some of this work. Yeah, I think we definitely had to pivot some of our research, especially with um, the community gardening, because we're working with a lot of um, elders and older folks, a lot of whom don't speak English. And so it's, I can't just head out to the garden and start interviewing them face to face. It's navigating the language barrier, um, if we were to have, you know, any sort of technology and use, making sure that they're literate in that technology and able to use it, um, but then also involving translators and things like that. So it's definitely changed. Um, and we've we've been really engaging the community in on this research to make sure that, you know, it's a lot more comfortable for someone who speaks the same language as you to be the sole person in the room asking you those questions. And so yeah. making sure that those, those details are, um, are known and and that you you know you change your methods to um, engage them and make sure that people are comfortable in that space because we're in a world right now where a lot of people are uncomfortable for a lot of different reasons um, and I think that's another reason why incorporating artwork and writing and not just Zoom calls into how we do our research is important too because every I mean everyone gets tired of Zoom calls I get tired of them. I don't want to spend all day in class and then go and be a part of some research where I'm sitting there in front of a camera talking again for another hour sometimes. So um, this obviously excluded, but um, I think that changing those methods and, and engaging other forms of um, engagement within um, social sciences is really important. I appreciate what you're saying about the, the Zoom call. And one thing I've noticed, it, it, it's not original to me, um, is the degree to which people seem to be s signaling their dissent against the Zoom call, and sometimes by having the camera off or on. But I've noticed that the backgrounds have gotten a lot more creative or sometimes very, very spare. Um, and I feel like there's things being communicated 
in the Zoom call that go beyond the sort of communication of the Zoom call. I don't want to read too much into it, but if I was doing ethnography of Zoom, I'd be paying a lot of attention to the uh, to the overall context of those calls. Jorge, I want to bring you in. There's a lot of creativity being discussed here right now about methods. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Um, yeah, but but for a quick comment on that, because I've been thinking about that, uh, looking at the politics of being in Zoom, like is it okay for if I get up in the middle of a conference and put the laptop in the kitchen next to me and start making my dinner or, you know, there's a lot going on there. What is, what's okay and what's not, and there's no rule book, right? So uh, even things like we discuss in our department, like you said, that's, that's the way you say hello or goodbye, not just hang up. Like if you were in person, you wouldn't just like turn around and leave. So those things, but um, going back to the own research, I think it's, it's been a challenging time for uh, social science researchers, especially those of us who rely more on ethnography because mm -hmm. it's, it's a face-to-face -face, right uh, thing. It's mm -hmm. not uh, if you're doing more survey-based research, it's it's still complicated, but there are ways to go about it. Um, but you know, doing participant observation, for example, the, which what you, was going to be a bigger part of my research, spending time in in policymaking organizations where I would just pretty much go volunteer. Hey, can I work here for a month for free? And in exchange, you know, you acknowledge that I'm doing this research and you like me, you let me take notes. I'm doing the same with the media, like a newspaper. I had one where I was hoping to stay there for months, helping them, you know, with their news, their health news. And they will allow me to be in like the, the editorial meetings so I could see the discussion of how they decide what a topic line is going to be, what news are going to cover, what goes in the front page, that kind of minutia that's the rich part of ethnography. Um, so you had to rethink it um, in terms of doing more um, you know, interview base. There are affordances too. You know, I was still having to interview people. You know, when I'm uh, in other parts of the U.S. because you know my funding doesn't allow me to travel all over, or if I have to interview people in Costa Rica, and, and not everyone was happy to be on Skype. Mm -hmm. it, it had been normalized, so now it's actually for those cases where I had to go on like a Zoom or Skype anyway. It's sort of easier because I don't even have to justify the Skype anymore. I just say, can we have an interview? And it's assumed that it's going to be over these media. So there are forces too. And then there's there's digital ethnographers who like I get they're having the ha moment, like showing their importance of, mm -hmm. of the new methods they're coming uh, uh, with, coming up with about how to do digital ethnography, studying communities, or how people interact through the digital world. So. Um, I think there's there's this balance and 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 it's going to provoke us to think of new new ways of doing research and new sort of like understandings of what the social space mean means and what is then then what a discipline accepts as valid forms of research. Yeah, I don't I don't want to um, downplay the importance of the digital divide, and it was a topic that I talked about yesterday with Blair Levin. So there's still obviously uh, for anybody who's doing field research, anthropology, sociology, or historians, whoever might be doing this kind of work, uh, there still may be a lot of people that you can't reach yep. right now because you can't go physically be with them. Yeah, and, and that's um, happening a lot with, yeah. with, uh, with a lot of colleagues. Like, I'm lucky because my the subjects of my research are researchers themselves, so I'm not having to go in a remote area, but there are a lot of anthropologists who the research was supposed to be somewhere far away, and then there's there's no way to do it. Right. Angie, uh, you were mentioning maybe there's some also discussions within universities as to mm -hmm. what media are allowable in this regard. Yeah. So w one of the things was whether or not we can share um, public, uh, I mean, health information, so um, private health information. And there was a whole discussion where I had to be brought in and I'm just thinking, oh, my God, this is just more service for me to do. <laughs> but um, what you know, it's like, can we use WhatsApp? And I'm thinking, why did you bring me into this? And they're like, well, because we're working with, and this is another researcher, um, we're working with Latino um, uh, groups and stuff like that. And they are, you know, they, they have technology, but they're, they don't want to use Zoom. I'm like, so what do they want to use? WhatsApp. And I'm thinking, you know, it took, it took my Mexicana grandmother <laughs> 10 years for us to go ahead and get into using text and then using WhatsApp. I think you need to find a way around that because you are going to reach the community via WhatsApp. You're not going to go ahead and reach them via Zoom, 
right? So um, I just said, like, it's as simple as that. You're going to have to go if you want to search, if you want to go ahead and reach this community for whatever public health thing you're doing, um, you're going to have to deal with IRB. I don't care about the technology, but you're going to have to go ahead and really adapt to their needs because, you know, this is how you're going to get that 75-year-old Mexicana Americana in Chicago, Illinois, grandmother mm -hmm. to actually do your survey. So, right. um, you know, it's like, that's it. Right. So it's, I think it's a lot of like, you know, um, some universities are very good about, you know, doing that type of, you know, let's find out. And some others are like, no, that's it. We only use Zoom and only through our channel. Jorge, did you want to come in on, on that? Um, yeah, so the WhatsApp thing is very big in Latin America and also itself a point of study, you know, and when you look at Brazil, for example, the, 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 the disinformation uh, right. uh, campaign uh, with Zika, now with COVID, the majority of it, both in India and in Latin America, has been through WhatsApp. Um, and looking, for example, how then some people would make uh, PDFs or images that look like official documents, but they are missing. That's what the, uh, you know, the infodemics is what they call it, right? The, 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 the epidemic of misinformation. And WhatsApp is, it's very important because as opposed to social media, where like let's say Facebook can go and ban stuff, it is a person-to-person -person communication. So in good theory, they if they're not reading my text, they shouldn't be able to block what I send. So things that are sent there are harder to control, uh, as you could like block, you know, someone sweet deleted or deleted Facebook. They just spread like wildfire, and and they have to be used. And in a lot of places, people don't have computers but have cell phones, and then WhatsApp becomes the one. And you know, things like the political economy of it, where WhatsApp will like have a deal with a local phone company where maybe your data is limited, but your WhatsApp messages don't count. So there's all these uh, different parts of it that that we need to understand uh, and not you know put certain uh, uh, platforms to the side, rather understand what is used in a particular place and culture and just go with it. Mm. I just want to remind everybody that you're listening to COVID calls and we're having a researchers roundtable today. I want to circle back to maybe some of the themes that we had on the table earlier around the way that scientific authority is is being cast in different um, national and subnational spaces right now, but also the place of physicians and future physicians in that discourse. And Chandi, I want to bring you Back in, I left a question kind of hanging in the air a little bit earlier about the the stresses of people in the health sciences and particularly maybe students in the health sciences, knowing that they're going into a time in which the authority of the physician is unstable, perhaps, or negotiable, maybe more than it has been. Can you say a little bit more about some of your thinking and some of your findings along those lines, particularly as a future physician yourself? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's definitely a question that, you know, I still struggle with. I think we all still struggle with that is, you know, what the future future will look like um, for, you know, the buy-in of, of scientific fact. Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to, um, meeting people where they are and saying, okay, you know, maybe you are a person who doesn't have a background in science. How can I, as someone who has a background, a vast background in science, and I understand all of the complexities that go into your diagnosis or, you know, the way that this pandemic is spreading or whatever it may be, how can I take those complexities and bring them down to your level in a way that will not belittle you, but that you'll understand? Um, and I think it's a careful balancing act of doing that because people want to feel validated and they want to feel heard. Um, and, and we're, you know, as, as scientists and, you know, future doctors and, and researchers, um, we need to validate them, but also stick to the facts and say, well, no, you're wrong here. Um, but if we can't back that up, th it's going to be heard on, you know, deaf ears. So. Well, I don't know, it's a difficult concept for sure. It, it is for sure. Let me stay with it because I had a, a COVID calls episode very early on with Peter Chin Hong, who's a physician in the University of San Francisco. And we were talking in the midst of the, of the George Floyd protests. And I was asking him, and you may remember there was some kind of uh, dust up there about whether or not physicians and public health uh, 
officials should be or should not be condoning protest. And Peter said, I have no problem with it because structural racism is a comorbidity. It, it causes death. And he was so clear in his statement and, I, and was so impressive in the way he said it. And of course, then he talked about harm reduction. He said, so if people are going to protest. I'm not there as a physician to tell them how, when, or where, or what to think, but if they're going to do it um, with this larger goal in mind, and he got into very sort of granular, like, advice that they were giving to protesters. I just, I kind of want to bring, bring you back into that, into that space, because that's really where medicine meets the streets right now, isn't it? Right. I mean, literally, it's meeting the streets. Um, and I think part of the difficulties with students right now is that it's it's hard to find that blueprint of, you know, some researchers, researchers will say, yeah, you know, you should be out there, you should be advocating. And others are still, you know, dealing with their own white fragility and the systemic racism within healthcare, um, and they aren't ready to have those conversations. Um, there are definitely also <laughs> other forms of social oppression that are impacting that. And so, you know, students are needing to learn how to be activists right now in these times, maybe, you know, not five years ago when you just take to the streets, but how do you do that now um, in a way that will protect vulnerable communities, um, but also change a lot of systemic oppression and racism within a system? So, Angie, just give you a chance to comment on this because this is obviously one of the findings, I guess, you're coming up with here. Yeah, yeah. And how do I protect them? And how do they protect themselves as, I mean, specifically for our, our findings on women of color in STEM and the medical sciences, how do they protect themselves or how do I help them navigate an emotional landscape where um, they are met with like this small racist symbolic violences? So in, you know, one of my conversations with students about what is stressing you is, you know, how do you deal when uh, with somebody, let's say you're drawing your blood and they have a whole entire tatti tattoo sleeve of a, of a swastika. What is my role as a professional here? And when they come to me, right, uh, not only do they owe me a paper, and I'm not saying that because you owe me a paper, Shandy, but they owe me a paper, they have to study for a test for the next day um, and go to work. How do you tell them, like, these people are still your patients? How do you teach them how to talk to, the, to, 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 to this type of patients who are not only only you're able to you're not able to maybe translate scientific thought but how do you do it in a way when you know are you able to get through them when they are you know emboldened to actually go against scientific discourse so that's where we're finding ourselves because the students are coming to us and they're even saying you should shouldn't you shouldn't you like the non-stem sociology professor shouldn't you know this and i'm like no, I don't, not at this time. So not only go to the streets and create change because it's bad government, and I'm paraphrasing Foucault here, um, as, as physicians, but also we need to understand what language we're gonna be using because you are, you know, in two years, Shandy is gonna be, you know, at, at, at the workforce. Um, and this is gonna continue. So it is this sense of ambiguity that we have to navigate, but also those of them who are BIPOC, how do they do it while maintaining their own sanity? Because they are coming, you know, they have to treat, you know, racist Flora with her MAGA hat and her baby. We're almost up on time, but mm -hmm. I want to get a couple more questions in. Jorge, um, I don't know how you find to do additional work while you're doing your work, but uh, <laughs> I guess maybe we're all multitasking. I, I did want to, uh, you shared that you're part of a rapid grant right now, an NSF rapid grant, funerary practices, pandemic confinement, and the implications for COVID-19 transmission. Sounds fascinating. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and what we come in though, uh, before I start that, Physicians have a long story of being activists. Remember that 1995, the Nobel Peace Prize went for to physicians for the prevention of nuclear war. So there's a long history of, of, of clinicians going into activist mode. But um, having said that, the, the, the rapid grant we, we got, at it's a, 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 several professors and myself at the George Washington University, we, you know, we were looking at, of course, thinking of, of death uh, and how it's become a, a central topic with this pandemic. 
And that, of course, means that there's going to be a lot of funerals, not only from COVID, but in general, but also the, the restrictions of gathering people, of, of this sort of like construction of spaces as, as centers of infection, including you know, funerary homes, was going to change practices. And, and funerary practices have a direct impact in, in looking at epidemics. If you think of 2013 in the, in the West Africa Ebola pandemic, part of the control of it, uh, you know, had to do with reimagining funerary practices that involved touching the body of that people because the way it was transmitted. So, so it is an important, it's not just the curiosity of, oh, I want to know what funerary practices look like, but it's because they have a direct impact on you know, how a disease spreads and can be used also for future policy making. And in a place like the United States, especially DC, where there are also many different religious groups. So there are different practices that adapt in different ways. So we want to know how uh, you know, people from different religious backgrounds are sort of like adapting and negotiating how they do this uh, you know, the new way of doing funerals on Zoom and who gets to go if only a few people can go and then how they invite the rest, do they do it live, do they do an event after. So the way we're doing this is uh, we try, we can, if people let us, invite us to be in a, in a funeral, we attend it, we interview people. We're taking um, surveys, so if anyone wants to participate, we have a website. It's called ritualsinthemaking.com. Um, so um, everyone's welcome there to take our survey, and if they want to participate, we can then follow up and do an actual interview. Um, and we're interviewing, you know, anyone from people who had family members passed away and had to organize uh, the funeral, funeral home workers, priests, pastors, any type of religious leader to know how they are then doing this. Because this information is also going to be useful in the, in the future where something like this happens again. And then we can know, okay, this is how we have to think about this very important part of human culture, which is ritual, especially, you know, funerary rituals. I'm going to give Chandi or Angie a chance to ask you questions about that because I have so many questions, but I, I don't want to hog the mic. So um, Chandi or Angie, what do you think about that work? I'm wondering how many people do you have involved and how are, how are like religious leaders answering your you know, your ask, because it is an ask to say, hey, can I do this? Okay. Well, I, I, I cannot do, I don't know number how many people, because mm -hmm. we're still recruiting, right? We're in the mm -hmm. phase of yeah. inter recruiting and, and doing interviews, and there's different members who do who do the interviews, so we're repositing. So we haven't started mm -hmm. uh, like a formal analysis. I cannot tell you mm -hmm. um, exactly. Um, it, it, it starts low, but actually there's been more more interest uh, lately of, mm -hmm. of people even volunteering, contacting us rather than us seeking mm -hmm. people um, to participate. Um, and uh, I think it's, I, I don't see uh, any like particularity, for example, or any particular religion. There's, mm -hmm. there's different ways and different people are gonna want to participate in research or not, sometimes more for their personal, opinion mm -hmm. rather than yeah. the, the religious background. They're just people who mm -hmm. like to talk about things and people who don't. Um, so at this point, we're there, right? And we're, it is a qualitative research. So we're hoping to get as many people as we can to either be interviewed or to let us participate in, in their rituals. And of course, it's all being gone through an IRB. Uh, you know, everything is anonymized. The information is put mm -hmm. in separate uh, silos. So it, it, is, it is a properly set up uh, project that does protect the, the people who participate and, and, and you know, we try to bring up conclusions in the traditional like, ethnographic kind of, of sense in this particular situation. One of the things that's been so um, impressive to me about the nature of death in COVID-19 is the distance and the isolation and even in the obituary I read today, I mean, that's kind of a standard feature of these discussions. And that's, of course, that's that's got its own multi, many dimensions to it. But one of the things is that for disaster victims, in many instances, it provides 
it, it can provide an opportunity for policymakers to bring certain deaths to the fore. And I've been, again, I've mentioned September 11 has been so much on my mind. And, you know, Rudy Giuliani, of course, is a very different character in our society now than he was in 2001 and two. But one of the things, not only him, um, but attending funerals very publicly um, and continually throughout that time was powerful gesture. I, it was, um, and he was, I, it's hard to understand the motives of a person that complicated, but he attended a lot more funerals than many people thought he would. And, you know, those were the essential workers of their time. Those were not soldiers. Those were cops and um, they were firefighters. It, it framed those deaths in a very unique way. And I, I'm, I'm just sort of, it's not even a very well-formed question, Jorge, but it's something that has been on my mind is the the problem of public officials not being able to participate in the mourning process of COVID-19 seems to have some impact on the way society perceives of the victims. Yeah, and, and we, we have been part of the research tracking a lot of those more public funeral events, right? Uh, George Floyd's funeral and then all of them happened. Also memorial sure. events in this year, there was recently a big open memorial event to, to everyone who died of COVID. Um, and, and it is, it is the, the I guess to say the, the performance, not in a pejorative way, but in the anthropological sense of, of certain official figures and how they create a sense of, of, of validation uh, by their physical presence will indeed have an impact in the same way that the people who go there have a, just the, the physically being in, in a ritual. And, and that's part of what got us thinking about this, you know, different traditional different traditions, different religions. Some are more used to, you know, being a ritual on TV, but some really need that sort of like face-to-face. -face. That's what validates, that's what makes the ritual real, is to have, you know, the, the priest there or, or in case of a memorial, uh, to sort of like that recognition of what the death of this person means to others. And that's something that needs to be unpacked, right, in, in terms of, of and, and those are, that's particularly, of course, salient in in this sort of like public funerals right and, and we go we see those it, it, it's different right we, it, we, it's not like we ask if we can go because they're transmitted through tv for example right so mm -hmm. but we observe it but they still are subject of analysis right uh, uh, yeah. because of that well we should probably wrap up uh and but i want to give it just a lightning round and give each of you a chance if there's something we didn't mention if you'd like to mention or uh a question coming out of this time that you see yourself maybe still going to be working on as we go into this into this fall and into 2021. Chandi, let me give you a chance just to reflect on anything we've been talking about or a final word. Thank you. Um, I just really real quick wanted to respond to this conversation about kind of the death at a distance that you brought up. And, you know, I've been hearing accounts from healthcare workers and their newfound role in you know, holding that phone for that last FaceTime call or those last words for a family and their loved one. Um, and I'm, I don't know, it's just, I guess, a general question I have of how will that, that burden on those healthcare workers, one, affect their practice, but two, affect how we view death um, in a hospital setting going forward, even, you know, in a time where we're not living through a pandemic. Um, just things I've been thinking about, but I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. This has been a really great um, round table and I've learned a ton. So Thanks for that observation too about the healthcare yeah, workers yeah. in that setting. I was having a conversation with a colleague uh, two weeks ago and, and she observed to me that she thought that there will be a lot of art made about this time and that undoubtedly there will be a film in which the protagonist is the nurse or the physician who's really good at what you just described. That somehow they get known when we've heard bits and pieces of these kinds of stories and they often appear in the obituaries um, that a nurse or a physician is the one holding up the phone we don't know the fullness of those stories yet angie same to you just yeah. a final chance here to comment yeah and, and and also so there's there's been you know new some some research coming up about empathy and medical students and how we train them. And this is some of the other things that I think social scientists should be informing us on 
death rituals and in any case but it's in the hospital setting like Shandy said because these are the things that we are going to have to teach and prepare our students and say by the way this is um you are you know you are shepherding people to a very hard time where they're no longer able to have the physical presence of the dead. And for some cultures, that is very important. And how do you do it? And how do you do it in a way that is actually going to go ahead and keep you in, uh, 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 with the least harm possible for you so you can continue? Because obviously, you are going to see this every day. You're going to have to be doing this every day. This is going to become standard practice. Yeah, thank, thank you again for this opportunity. It's been so wonderful. I learned so much from all of you. Jorge, I guess uh, the last word is to you today. Uh, well, thank you. And yeah, thank you for uh, inviting uh, me and, and, and for allowing me to meet uh, great researchers at, and learn about your work. Um, first, I, I you know, again, like remind people of, of the big toll that it's taking on healthcare workers as well. Uh, just last week, one of my Professors died of COVID. He was an intensive care physician back in Costa Rica. Um, so that, that you know, made us think a lot about it. Um, but the other is, you know, putting back my academic research in STS scholar, I, I had some people tell me, oh, you know, I cannot, I don't know what to do because I, I don't do research on COVID. So, you know, everything seems to be around COVID. It's like, I wanted to encourage people that a lot of the research idea that can come from now are really, are because of COVID, but doesn't they don't have to be about COVID. We, there's a richness now. We have to learn that there's going to be new ways of teaching, new ways of interacting, new ways of you know, new ways people are going to make companies. Uh, how how labor is going to be distributed from home versus at the office. There are a lot of societal changes that are happening because we had the pandemic, but that doesn't mean you have to study COVID itself. So there is. A lot of things that we're going to have to see this. That the world is going to is going to be a different. It's going to be different. We're not going back anywhere to anything. We're going to something new, and and we have to you know, look at those things as well. Well, I think that's a, a really important uh, place to leave it, and it, and it's something that uh, Angie was saying earlier that we're all sort of COVID researchers now, which is also to say, as was said earlier, we're hopefully. Uh, if we're COVID researchers, if we're pandemic researchers right now, we're also social justice researchers and we're this disaster in all of its many layers has to be has to be considered. I want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls and a really wonderful and vigorous discussion in the researchers roundtable today. Tomorrow we'll be talking about the Postal Service. Um, I could tell you that when this year started, I wouldn't have thought that in October, just before the election, I'd be having a uh, podcast discussion about the Postal Service, but um, it actually is an important topic uh, for COVID and also for the election. I'll be talking with um, two great guests, Ryan Ellis, who's already been on COVID calls, and I'll be talking with Richard John as well. So please join me tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time for that. And thanks to Chandi Katoch, Jorge Benavides Rawson, and Angie Mejia for a great discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow, 5 o'clock.